<laughs> breaking the ice. So here we go. <laughs> Sometimes I'm dyslexic. I oh, want yeah. to be in, I want to be in November. I don't know if I want to. Well, uh, my name is Philippe Saad. I'm a co-chair of uh, this wonderful committee, and I'm joined by Ruth Neiman. She's my counterpart, co-chairs of this committee as well. Uh, today, uh, we will be start talking about dementia-friendly environments and uh, how do they manifest themselves? How, how do they look like? Before we dive into the subject, I would like to put in a few dates out to everyone. So our next meeting will be on November 15, and it'll be about designing landscape for the aging population. We will have two guest speaker landscape architects who will be sharing their insights. Uh, before November 15, I wanna bring everybody this to everybody's attention. The Women in Design Committee at the BSA and the Design for Aging are collaborating in a symposium called Intersections. And it's about accessibility and equity in the built environment. It will take place October 28 and 29. There will be keynote speakers and three sessions on October 28th, and there are some site tours on October 29th. In a day or two, this information will be available on the BSA website for those who would like to attend this, this upcoming symposium. Um, <clears throat> this is an AIA accredited presentation and discussion. I will once, once again put in the information for those of you who have just recently joined us and would like to receive IA credits. Uh, it's in the chat right now. Um, so let's dive in and start with our program. I will start by saying that sometimes when people hear dementia unit, memory care unit, they feel overwhelmed and rightfully so. It is a specialty to some of us here on the call, but we believe that the knowledge of dementia friendly design should be available to all architects, designers, planners, we all have the responsibility in building tomorrow's cities. And so far, dementia is very much part of our future. I think we know the statistics. The number of people with dementia is not getting smaller. Uh, as I was consulting the Google last night, ex quote unquote, experts report that more than 7 million people ages 65 or old, older had dementia in 2020. If current demographics and health trends continue, more than 9 million Americans could have dementia by 2030. I chose 2030 because it is eight years away and it's not really far away when we consider that when you start thinking about a project or a community or a developer and operator start thinking about a project, eight years is not far, far away. It takes approximately five to eight years sometimes to get an idea from inception to, to, to to final construction. So all of us here, as we start our next project, let's really think about that large number of people, residents and visitors and family members of these projects that we will be designing, um, how they walk the place, how they enjoy the environment and how they live supported in, in the communities or their environment. Um, today, we will be thinking about all these older adults with diagnosis or without. There are a lot of people with early stages of cognitive impairment of Alzheimer's and people undiagnosed. People can start having dementia, some, some signs of dementia as young as 40 years old. Uh, people going to work every day, going to the supermarket and getting confused in their environment. It is around us and it is our duty to create an environment that would support these people to be independent as long as possible. So cities and towns in Massachusetts are focusing on addressing the needs of their aging populations, including people living with cognitive issues. A dementia friendly community is informed, safe, respectful, and enables people living with dementia and those who care about them to live full engaged lives. But what does it look like? What are the physical environmental features that will support these stated goals? Over the past year, the Dementia Friendly Massachusetts Initiative led by program manager Patricia Sullivan here with us and Pam McLeod, executive office from the Executive Office of Elders Affairs have been working with the members of the Design for Aging Committee and other groups around their states and many others to put such vision in application. The result is a guide to, to 
that help all of us plan how to design dementia friendly. The first part of this discussion, and I'm hoping this will be a discussion and not really a, a show from the four of us, a discussion among all of us, uh, is to, to go over some aspects of the report. Then we will go over uh, some guidelines and maybe uh, imagery of how design friendly environment could look like. And then we will close with a case study of the Norwell Senior Center that Ruth Neiman has done going over the details, uh, what is and what is not, and how can we make spaces that are already built uh, dementia friendly. With this, I will turn it to Ruth and Patty. Okay, and I will share my screen. So just to give you a very, very quick idea of what we're talking about, the two images left and right are in a memory care unit. The one on the left is the before, the one on the right is the after. And later on, we can have a quiz, what is dementia friendly and what isn't. So, um, Okay, Patty, this is, uh, floor is yours. Great, thank you very much to both of you and to Pam. Uh, this has been an incredible year for us in the dementia friendly world in that we've had the chance to engage and learn from architects about the built environment around us and how we can make it in very concrete ways, more dementia friendly. So my name is Patty Sullivan. I direct the Dementia Friendly Massachusetts program. I work for the Massachusetts Councils on Aging. So we represent the 350 towns across the Commonwealth that have councils on aging and are interested in learning about dementia. Under our initiative, we have right now about 101 towns that have pledged to be dementia friendly and another 25 who I su suspect will come in in the next uh, month or so. So this is a very rich and engaging opportunity for towns and cities to reach out and to build, as Philippe said, an environment that's supportive of people living with dementia and their caregivers. And, you know, Pam and I have worked in this space for a while and we could give you a hundred of examples of the importance of this, but I think our, the latest work that we're releasing and talking about today really makes it much more concrete. So Ruth, can you flip slides? Yes. So how did, how did we get here? There's no way to make bureaucracy interesting or entertaining. So I just decided to sort of lay things out. In the state of Massachusetts, we have exceptional support for age and dementia friendly efforts. It starts with the governor's uh, advisory commission on aging. We have tremendous support from Point 32 Health great partners at the Alzheimer's Association, the Commission on Alzheimer's and Other Dementias, and then the initiative that I manage called Dementia Friendly and our leadership team. So we have a pretty comprehensive and connected set of organizations and initiatives aligned with funding priorities that have allowed us to grow this work. So next slide, Ruth. So our, the most recent work that we have done in conjunction um, with Ruth and Philippe in many ways uh, through the work of the governor's or the advisory committee on dementia and uh, other, I'm sorry, Alzheimer's and other dementias. So we released last week at the governor's advisory committee a report that proposes age and dementia friendly considerations. 
these are not specific guidelines. They don't tell you how tall the bench should be or where you should put the um, braces to help people get up or it's not that detail, but it is very suggestive and specific about helping people who want to create this supportive environment about how to go about doing that. And it is designed both for new builds and also existing infrastructure because you know you have to paint the town hall or the senior center or the library or replace the carpet so getting people to think about anytime they do anything to a building new and old this is a way to help them think through it so ruth next slide so i i think the important part of this report is to remind us about physical infrastructure and the way it influences how we live our lives. And you as architects understand that better than anybody. But the, there's a whole science around aging and environment called environmental gerontology. And it the, the work in that academic field supports the work that we're doing today in that it reflects how we all react to our environment. And it's more important for us to have that kind of environmental support, particularly when we age. So Pam, did you want to add anything? No, you're doing a great job, Patty. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Ruth. You. Okay. So um, just a few uh, points touching on challenges of aging. Uh, and um, the statement is that dementia is not normal part of aging. Dementia is usually a manifestation of some sort of a uh, disease. And people that live with dementia, for the most part, are because of their age, because dementia is more prevalent as people age, uh, are also challenged by other underlying conditions. So it's not just the cognitive issues, but it is the hearing impairment. It's the vision that's going down. It's the agility that's not there anymore. It's the balance. So that in, in addition, the people are kind of dealing with a perfect storm uh, that that they have to um, uh, continue to function. So the more support the environment in any way, shape, or form can provide for them, the better off they are. Um, so what we see, what we hear, what we touch, what we smell, uh, what we walk on. Uh, makes the environment in which we live. And appropriate design will create a good experience as opposed to every time you have to go somewhere, every time you look in a certain direction, it starts with a struggle. If there is a window at the end of the corridor where you're heading and it's glary every time you struggle with it, how can you maintain sunny disposition? If you're constantly struggling, it leads to frustration, it leads to agitation, and it also leads to decline. So if we can eliminate those barriers, think about them, try to wear the glasses and uh, the uh, imaginary glasses and think about how people with that are dealing with all these um, capacities that are diminishing are perceiving the environment and we can compensate, we've done what we, what we need to do. So um, what is the role of the environment for uh, support? First of all, it's just really physical support. If you're walking and there is a handrail and you can lean on something, you're better off. You're, you're less likely to fall, especially if that handrail is easy to grab, it's not too ornate or too uh, um, painted with the wall to be cool. It needs to stand out so that you can see it's there. 
um, and the, the environment is compensating for diminishing abilities. And the whole point is eliminating truly unnecessary struggles. And just a, a little shout to our uh, kind of Bible of, of help wherever we go, universal design, universal design. If, if most of our uh, audience today is architects and even uh, you can hear the, the, the repeat mantra, universal design. It's a design that is inclusive, that thinks of every people's different needs, abilities or disabilities and makes the environment uh, manageable without uh, workarounds or without feeling like they need special dispensation. So before we get there, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, uh, ask Philippe to, to take the screen. First, unmute myself. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, let's make sure I share. So the next part of our discussion is, um, so I would like to frame our discussion on dementia friendly more from an inclusive approach. Inclusive is Inclusive design is something very important to me, and I like to see dementia-friendly design fall within this. And um, in the past week, I was listening to a podcast with Bob Inglis. He is a representative from South Carolina, and he lost in 2010 because he was the supportive of, of supportive of the environment. Uh, he's a Republican. His party was not supporting uh, him but he ran because he was convic convinced that we need to work on the environment. He said something in the podcast that it's all about how the conversation is framed. Uh, because when it's framed properly and in the language of the group that is there to listen, then the message is received much better. For me, I see dementia friendly part of overall inclusive design, trying not to leave anyone behind. Whether you are older or younger, you have cognitive impairment of this type, of that type, it just makes for a better overall design. We think always about uh, how spaces could be inclusive. Sometimes we think about one group over the other, but like Ruth was saying, inclusive design means very, very, large group of people. And when we can find a common thread that provide an environment that is supportive to the majority of the people, I think our designs is going to serve those people for the longer, for the longer period of time. I wanna highlight this page in the report and because it's important. It says in the United States, Alzheimer's and dementia related disorder disproportionately impact people of color who are more likely to develop dementia than their white counterparts. This has a big meaning uh, as we uh, work to make our society more inclusive and more diverse. And we know that there is a large group of people that would be heavily affected by dementia and Alzheimer's. I wanna put this out there because I wanna also again, frame it through inclusivity and diversity and um, that's, Diversity and inclusivity is not only one thing. It could be multiple layers of thing and ability, physical ability and cognitive ability is one of them. And there's multiple, multiple intersections of different identities that really constitute the person. And hence reinforcing the need to, to find a design solution that would be relevant and supportive to as many people as possible, including people from different cultural backgrounds, including people from different racial, racial backgrounds, gender and age, et cetera. So, so why do we sometimes not think about the older generation? I found this quote in Ashton Applewhite's book, The Chairs Rock. And I believe, and I believe she's right, is because we think getting older is ugly and we try to avoid it. 
rather than seeing it as something to build towards as a benefit to our society. How many of us have been in environments like these where light is dim, it is a beautiful atmosphere, we, can, we can't either not hear who's next to us or read the menu and we feel isolated, we turn our cell phones pretty bright uh, light on the menu and suddenly we pay attention to ourselves. This is an environment that is not an environment that is inclusive to everybody. A menu with little fonts like these looks pretty on paper. Graphic designers seem to love it. But then if I have to use my cell, my cell phone to shine the lights, it is not an inclusive approach to design. I brought these two is because uh, inclusive design is not only architecture or interior design, it's everything. It's the environments that we live in. And I think signage is one of them, writing is another, and we'll go over this in, in, in some details today, but this is also addressed in the report that, uh, that Patty had mentioned. Who would not feel confused in a space like this? <laughs> uh, walls are similar color as the floors, the stair is concealed, uh, the walls continue and become the ceilings. And on the image on the left-hand side, entrances are not really clear. There's some glass, there is some nice brickwork, there's a path, but uh, the path is not clear. Where are the entrances? And once you make it through the entrance, you are lost. People with some vision impairment might not notice where the handrail is, where the wall starts, where the mm. floor begins. I always put this up because it says nursing home in Portugal. It's from, from, from a standpoint of architects, it, it is a pretty building. It fits in its environment. It, is, uh, it, it reflects what's around it, but it's not a building that, that allows people to come together, uh, find their way on that meandering path and ends up with dead ends where people feel isolated and ex excluded. Another example is also a, a senior housing, again in Portugal, where there is no clear circulation. When you're, when you're around one of those cubes, which constitute housing for individuals, you're, you're lost, you're in a maze. And people with some disorientation uh, are even further lost and need help and assistance. I don't mean to put all the non-dementia friendly example being in Europe, but it happened that I pulled those examples. Uh, then the red light turns on to say that you're in trouble and people yeah, can help you. Actually, you're right. <laughs> really? I didn't want to mention this. Yes, this is a place where if you need help, you press a button and your cube just lights up. Oh my God. And then you have the help, the nurse, the, the, the care staff, can come in, talk about privacy, right? Okay, I thought it was a good joke. <laughs> no, it is, but it's not a dementia friendly thing, so I didn't bring it up, but it, it is just not an example that I would like to follow. Uh, so uh, the next few slides are just to tell everyone here is that dementia friendly doesn't need to be boring or ugly or old fashioned or institutional or something we wanna avoid. And also dementia friendly is not, doesn't need to be all or nothing. It could be pieces of something. It could be, because remember, what we're making the case for here today is not to design dementia units where we know that the majority of people are gonna have a very high level of cognitive impairments. We wanna design environments where the majority of us could live independently as long as possible. So these are environments that uh, don't need to follow every single guidelines that we can find to make a place uh, dementia friendly. It could be a different, different ingredients. But overall, I wanted to put out there five, maybe five um, guiding principles for spaces to be dementia friendly. And I think this is, a, this is a list of elements that the group with Pam and Patty and, and Ruth uh, have discussed early on in the report, and it's made it made its way to the reports uh, through it entirely. So spaces want to be objects want to be familiar, 
and recognizable. What is familiar? It means that you, based on your background, your cultural sensitivity, you can identify what something is. We often use the word of the, the example of a bench. When a bench looks like a bench, we know that we have to, we can stop and sit on that bench along the path. But when a bench is an amorphous shape in the landscape, I'm a person who has some <clears throat> trouble recognizing my environment. I will find it hard to find this bench as a place to sit and take rest in my path. Legible, clear, and uncluttered. It applies to <clears throat> writing, signage, but also space. Um, by clear and unclutter, it refers to really the space and the environment when there is interior decoration or accessorizing. Keep it simple so that <clears throat> people don't have sensory overload, that things are, uh, are clear when there's a sign when there is a, a wayfinding mechanism in the building, that this is very legible and simple. <clears throat> Recently, I faced on a, an affordable senior housing where we're filing this project to be fit well. And fit well has a extensive need for signage. And we had to really draw the line on what is appropriate for the signage to be legible and where signage starts losing its importance and start confusing people when there's too much information on a sign. <clears throat> Accessible and barrier free, I think for most of us, this is obvious. We want this space to be able to help people with different physical abilities. Um, safe uh, is a place where Either people could be there unsupervised if it's a dementia unit where people could be outdoor in a safe courtyard, in a safer environment, away from uh, having to wander and put themselves into danger, but also putting away objects that we that might um, uh, make people hurt themselves. Locking some cabinets, some utensils, uh, we need to be mindful of those. When we review a cabinet shop drawings and we think that this space might have people with some, some advanced or, or medium level cognitive impairments, we want to think about, do we need to lock those cabinets? Do we need to lock the stove? Um, <clears throat> the last one is comfortable and adjustable. Comfortable could immediately equate furniture, but also we want to think about it from a lighting and shading perspective. Uh, tunable la white, Tunable, tunable lighting is something that is adjustable. Uh, shades in a space is what is adjustable as well and can make a space comfortable or not. Um, reflective surfaces are <clears throat> sometimes not comfortable for people because it creates glare in their eyes. So we have to think about all these different elements as we start designing spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. The next few images are just going through some, some of uh, my project, Mel Schaefer's projects that are not necessarily dementia related, but they have dementia friendly elements in them. Um, you might notice that they're not all the features in them are familiar, legible, accessible, safe, comfortable, or adjustable, but there are elements of those because remember, we're not designing dementia units, we're designing spaces that need to serve as the, the larger majority of people. Uh, that's an enhanced living, dining room, uh, portrait Govin Canton Mass. And I want to note the muted, but yet colorful carpet. There is some pattern on the floor, but it's not uh, threatening to people. It doesn't create thresholds. Uh, the patterns on the back of the chairs that contrast with the frame of the chairs, patterns are okay as long as they're not uh, confusing patterns where people um, don't know what these patterns are. Art is clear, it's a painting, it's flowers. There is contrast between uh, chairs and floors. And plants in this case are artificial plants. They will prevent people from uh, putting things in their mouth that is not uh, totally safe. The next image is an independent living apartment. And I put this on purpose because 
we take careful attention to a contrast between cabinets and counters, counters and floors, colors of furniture on the wood floors, as well as uh, co contrast between furniture and flooring. Uh, you would notice that the chairs on the left-hand side don't have arms. If this was more of a public setting in amenity space, it could have been furnished with arms. This is a somebody's apartment. So again, it is not a dementia unit. There's some features in this. The cabinet handles have contrast also with the cabinets in the back, again, to, to notify those elements. When we talked about with the committee, we said dementia friendly doesn't need to be expensive. It can be very simple, but it's just a matter of choosing the right elements as we start designing our environment. I like to put this because that's a multifamily housing in Cambridge. It didn't need to be to have a contrast between the counter and the cabinet, but we chose to do so because it will help people identify the different services. You don't need to be a senior to have some sort of cognitive or visual, visual vision impairment. It's just good design is good for everybody. <laughs> um, an example of a bathroom, whether it's a very small budget bathroom on the left-hand side for affordable housing, or it's more of a luxury bathroom on the right-hand side, there are ways where elements could contrast each other. Uh, no need to introduce color, but you can introduce a tone to make the sink stand out, <clears throat> for example. Um, looking outside of the residential apartments themselves, more into the, the corridors, uh, signifiers are important in the space. Again, these are not dementia units. This is <clears throat> affordable housing on the left-hand side, not for seniors, and a nursing home on the right-hand side. There's a contrast between the door and the frame for people to recognize. The door is recognizable. The handle at the door is, has a contrast with the door. <clears throat> and then there's a bench on the left-hand side that allows people to sit waiting for the elevators, again, for the comfortable um, elements. There's a mailbox that signifies the main entrance and uh, there's a light. So all that are those residential fields uh, that leads you to the nursing floor. On the left-hand side, <clears throat> Uh, this is a this is an affordable housing for people with MS. So losing eyesight is is an issue for people as the disease progresses. Contrast between handrails and walls. Remember that first image that I showed where the handrails matches the wall. Here the handrail is in sharp contrast with the walls. It matches the base for consistency, but then the wall contrasts with the floor. There's a difference in flooring pattern between the floor and the field, but again, it's subtle. It adds a little bit of a texture, but it doesn't create a, 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 a threat, a, a fear for people to step into uh, the next uh, flooring area. And of course, something you cannot miss is the, or the yellow doors. Every floor is different color, but here we did some very bright colors because people eyesight degenerates and we needed to make sure that as this eyesight degenerates, the contrast is maintained. I want to tell people don't be afraid of colors when you work, when you do any dementia friendly. Uh, <clears throat> red brings appetite. Patterns in the right places are good. It brings activity and enjoyment and livelihood. Uh, colorful black splash, colorful back of chairs. Again, the contrast that I had mentioned previously and the recognizable objects throughout that space. <clears throat> um, similar. Um, this is one of our latest completed project. It's an assisted living, definitely not a dementia unit, but it has all those elements of recognizable objects, contrasty elements, uh, comfortable seating, and um, a space where people could have small conversations. Um, simple aesthetics. If it was a dementia unit, maybe we would have removed some objects from the shelving, but that's an assisted living. Uh, and not necessarily a dementia unit. And I think the last one is actually a, a memory care unit for Spring House in Boston. And all the different elements that I've mentioned kind of converge here because this has to serve people with an advanced level of Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, I wanna to point to everybody the importance of an art piece that is very clear and opens the appetite 
and suggest food. This is a place, this is a dining space at on the floor, on the dementia unit. And we could have chosen something else that is clear, but we purposely chose an element that suggests food because we want to remind people to be able to eat in that space. Remember, people don't have their cognitive abilities in, in, in this environment. Again, the contrast and the tables and the chairs and the colors and a good amount of lighting that is bright enough for people to be able to understand their environment. Uh, this is a space on the other side. It's the living space of that unit. <clears throat> and here we added some textures on the wall behind the fireplace just to create, to, to stimulate people's uh, uh, senses uh, and engage in the environment. You will notice the, the sofas, the chairs are, have a, a very strong pattern, but that strong pattern contrasts with the floor and contrasts with the armchairs soft edges, soft contours, and soft arms around the chairs for that comfort and that safety element. Um, with this, I actually, one last thing. <clears throat> uh, maybe we do this at the end, Ruth. This is a little bit about the report. Once you do, you do the, the Norwell okay. walkthrough, then we can talk about the report. Sounds I will good. unshare. Mm -hmm. And I will share. So we're back to the image that we started with. And um, oops, before, before we leave it, uh, this is a living room in a memory support unit. And when we walked in there uh, with a task to renovate it, uh, there weren't, we, we didn't have a lot of trouble uh, identifying what was wrong with it, even though this building uh, that is located in San Antonio, Texas, had really, really good bones. But um, we just looked at the space, looked at the glare, looked at the uh, patterns on the floor, looked at the low lighting, the high ceiling that people thought would be great actually made the space feel unhomey and people didn't, didn't like to, to be there. And it basically looked like a furniture warehouse for recliners. So we took it, we changed colors, we made the lighting more uh, level and, um, and um, without a lot of uh, patches of light and shadows and actually split the space into two sitting groups. So the sitting groups is a lot more residential feeling. And that goes back to the comfortable and familiar people when they come from their living rooms at home, they don't uh, find themselves in a um, furniture uh, recliner store. So now to the to the um, uh, little experiment that we did for a um, conference that uh, Patty uh, invited me to present. Uh, Patty, do you want to give a little bit of um, uh, just a um, introduction to to this? senior center to Susan and to what she was facing. Hmm. Can you hear us? Patty said she had to drop off, but it seems like she's still connected. I don't know if she's- oh, Okay, all right. So uh, I, I know the, uh, a little bit about the story. So uh, Norwell uh, was uh, very, very fortunate for the town to have just voted on a a uh, new community center, senior center combined in a new building with some uh, a sports facility and a swimming pool and gyms and uh, community rooms. And they made the, the decision, the wonderful decision that the senior center is really part of the community center and there's no reason whatsoever to segregate the seniors in a separate room, a separate space of building. Uh, this new building is going to uh, probably come online if they're lucky four or five years because the town just voted on it. So there's still a long hopeful process that will end up with a great building and, and great services for the seniors of Norwell. Uh, but right now, the Norwell Senior Center is in this um, small house 
that uh, is actually two stories because the site is sloping down, but that is its first um, impression. Uh, and just for uh, orientation, this is the building. We were looking at a view from this front entrance point. It is. It has a um, pretty large and maybe not that defined uh, parking lot. And then the road here slopes pretty significantly. And then there is a lower level that daylights on the other side. And there are some rooms uh, in the lower level that enjoy direct access to the site on the back and there's direct access to the site from the upper level on the front. Uh, this area doesn't look this way uh, anymore. I think a lot of these ve this vegetation was taken down and there is a um, large kind of playing field area right across the street here. So these are the plans, uh, nothing fancy. Um, these are the entrance stairs. You have to uh, step up three stairs to a door uh, and a very small tight reception area and another room that's called reception. Uh, and we don't know why, and we, we had to kind of do something about it. Uh, this is the, the uh, larger entrance area where there's some sitting and some uh, dining uh, and some sort of activity table, uh, uh, men's and women's restrooms that are spacious and accessible, a couple of offices here. And then at one point, uh, the building ended in on this line. Uh, and a few years back, there was a an addition and renovation of this building where an elevator was added to connect this floor with the lower floor. And in this wing, there are uh, a couple of offices and a conference room, conference room for the staff. So this is the upper level. And the upper level, uh, this plan didn't show it clearly, has a side door that leads to a small residential deck. Uh, that deck has a ramp that goes up to it, but the front entrance, as we saw before, is not accessible. And this is the lower level. So this part here is buried. Uh, this part here is also buried with a little uh, English court windows that have a little uh, uh, light that comes in from above. This is the elevator that we saw before. This large dining game room area uh, actually suffered a blow from the new addition because all the windows that were along this wall are now gone. So we have a very large space with a very small uh, natural light source, which is the uh, glass light in, in this door, a restroom, mechanical room, a kitchen that is an enclosed door. And then the addition actually is doing much better. It has some glass windows, a double door into directly into the lower level. So there is a uh, computer classroom and a game room in here and some storage and support. So the way we, we did this little um, uh, audit or case study, we went uh, element by element and started looking at uh, the dementia friendly features. Are there any dementia friendly features? Um, what are the problems? What can be easily done to fix things? So uh, the, the first thing that, uh, that you see when you uh, uh, approach this, uh, this building is that it looks residential. So that's, that's a good thing because it really uh, uh, goes along with the looking comfortable and familiar. It's a house. It's not a super modern, unrelated, non-contextual building. It's a house. So people feel comfortable going there. Uh, however, as soon as you get there, you have this uh, uh, hurdle that you have to overcome, which are the stairs. And yes, they did a good thing with providing information and saying, sorry, guys, this uh, entrance here is not accessible. But if you go either to the right or the left, there are some accessible features that, that you can deal with. Uh, the parking lot, as I said, doesn't look very residential. 
Uh, I may be cheating a little. A wide angle does a lot to make this parking lot look larger than it, it is, but it is a large kind of commercial looking parking lot. Um, but there is an ample parking, there is ample drop off, and, and it does look residential, which is a good point. So what are the issues? Some of them we talked about. The front door is not accessible. The front entry could be, could take a little more drama, maybe with color, maybe with um, uh, a little higher kind of uh, overhang and also better overhang for drop off uh, during uh, um, uh, bad weather. And um, it's, it's kind of very low key and maybe I would say too much of a low key. Stairs, not, not very noticeable. It's just a house. So when you move in and I decided to keep the uh, floor plan uh, as a little thumbnail here so that we can kind of remind ourselves what we're looking at. So you enter into this space and this is it. Can you all see my uh, cur cursor? Okay. So you enter a door, no vestibule. You open the door in the middle of a snowstorm. Everybody's freezing. You open the door in the middle of a 95 degree day. Everybody is complaining. So you enter and there's this little nook here with a bulletin board and some information and brochures. And here is the My Senior Center sign-in uh, um, station. So you can imagine that when there are uh, 20 people coming to an exercise class and they all are trying to huddle in this little area to get to the sign-in uh, uh, station, this area here is kind of cramped and not that great. But then you take, uh, you open the door and go into this space right to the right here and it looks like a reception but it really doesn't function much like a reception and there's a little coat closet and um we were thinking what we can do in order to to work with this so but there are some dementia friendly uh features as uh philippe ta talked about before there is a very clear distinction between the floor with the white base and the different color of the walls. So that really uh, works well. Uh, the private office is very spacious and comfortable. There is, uh, they're the, making a lot of use of Dutch doors and that was actually uh, started during COVID when they wanted to stay away from those plexiglass um, um, partitions that really didn't feel inviting. So they created the ability to serve and to talk just by a little bit of distance. You don't walk in and stand right here over me. You open the, the top part of the door and can communicate with the staff member that's in, in the office. Uh, all, the, all the windows in the space do have um, shade control. So whenever there's sun coming uh, from a, a certain direction, it can be controlled, glare can be controlled, and also like patches of light on the um, floor can be controlled. So going, staying in the same situation, uh, actually I talked about the, the, the issues before I talked about the good things. I should change my attitude, start with the good first. So yeah, this is, this is very, can be very cramped area. And if people are waiting here during uh, a bad weather, snowstorm, they're waiting here. And every time the door opens, they get a blast of cold air. Uh, another feature that uh, is probably due to maybe um, not the best use of space. And this area here is actually right along this wall here. So when you enter and, and spend time in the main space, you see this that is very cluttered, cluttered in terms of visual elements on the wall, cluttered because that's where they do all their copying, 
cluttered because that's where they organize all the meals on wheels that they have to, to um, uh, distribute. So this is a very, very busy work area that maybe should not be as like the background wall of the, of the main space when you enter. Uh, a problem, <clears throat> there is no vestibule, no place to transition between the out, outdoor to the indoor, no place to change, uh, take boots off or take coats off. It's just like you open the door and you're smack in, in the main space. Um, and then um, administrate, administrative support should be in the back of house. And that's, that's this wall of uh, unrelated activities to the activities of the, rest, the, the clients that are coming. So the other Ruth, Ruth one thing, Patty raised her hand. Patty, yeah. do you want to say something? Oh, sorry. You're muted. Here. I, I just wanted to mention, Ruth, that the you know, one of the things you've pointed out in terms of clutter and administrative stuff, senior centers have to push out so much information. Mm -hmm. We you know, we can't do it via staff. So we tend to have all this stuff all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying to figure out, and we'll talk more about this when you make your recommendations, is that, you know, how do we keep all the flyers we need to have? And at this, but at the same time, not creating clutter and confusion um, because- Right. And also, those boards end up being a place for people to socialize. Mm -hmm. So they see the board and they say, hey, I'm going to go to the dementia friendly design seminar tonight. How about you? And it, it becomes sort of a social gathering spot. So I, you know, I, I get what you're saying, but I'm, I'm interested to hear your solution. Great. Yes, that, that's a very good point. And actually, the, the, the clutter comment was not that much on the wall, but everything that's in front of it, which kind of prevents people from gathering and reading. But what do you do? Where do you do all these activities? Um, the, the big copier is here. So there's this activity that actually happens in front of the information center that maybe if we think about another spot for it, the information center would be more uh, useful. So now we go into um, the um, main space, which this view here is actually standing right in this spot. The entry area is to, um, to my left, if I'm standing and looking this way to my left right here. And this is a very nice um, kind of not crazy colors, but keeping the concept of contrast between furniture and floor, uh, furniture and floor here as well. Considering that some of these furnitures are uh, donations, uh, I guess they were very fortunate donations. And uh, except for this wall where we do have a lot of activity, I think this entire space in terms of what's there and the bookshelves that really make this feel like a living room or a den or family room at home rather than a hotel lo lobby and uh, um, uh, windows with the window shades, plants, standing lamps are really a great thing that makes a space feel much more homey and residential. And then, so I will talk only about the good things first. Um, so we have uh, rich, visually rich, but not overwhelming. Uh, there's the, all the color and the contrast and the, the, the nice uh, light base here that differentiates between the walls and, and um, floor, uh, appropriate artwork and landmarks of what's, what's happening through the window or by um, the, the different artwork pieces, window shades and, uh, and lamps. But then uh, you go, oh, so I guess I talked about both things in the same time. 
And the main thing that is kind of not great here is the um, lighting that doesn't look residential at all. It does give uh, ample light, but it doesn't look like a living room. So there's a lot of, um, of good stuff that can happen to the ceiling for not a huge amount of money and kind of take it to really to another level. So uh, now we are, we're visiting the bathrooms. There are two accessible bathrooms right here. Uh, that's where you enter. That's the big living room that we just looked at. And these are the two bathrooms and uh, they are comfortable. They are accessible in terms of enough space. Uh, the grab bars are contrasty to the wall, great. So is the water closet contrasty to the floor and to the wall behind. So it's uh, much easier to, uh, to locate and aim. Um, the lavatory is also a different color than the counter, which is a different color than, than the vanity next to it. Yes, the mirror is a little too high uh, because if there's somebody in a wheelchair, the mirror should be should be lower. Uh, the window is also protected with a with a um, shade to provide um, protection from glare. And this is what we call the uh, kind of um, duplicating messages to make sure that that it's clear uh, that the um behavior the expected behavior is clear so it's not just a sink with a soap and uh, the disinfectant you have a very good looking colorful visible um, um poster that says what you're expected to do in in this um location so basically the bathroom uh really got uh high marks in 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 the um uh dementia and age friendly category. Uh, it did have a few issues and, and um, I kind of touched on it with accessibility. The mirror is not low enough and uh, the vanity is not one of those that opens up to have the floor of the room to continue in there. So in case there is somebody in a wheelchair, they can uh, uh, enter or, or position themselves with their knees sort of inside the cabinet under the counter so that's that's a little um uh, a little issue and then um one of the things that uh, i have seen in um in uh senior center or adult day centers is the need for people to keep some uh clothes changing in case Uh, some food spills, or there are other issues. And uh, I also talked to um, the, the director, Susan uh, Curtin, about the fact that these uh, bathrooms are spacious enough that they can take, at least one of them can take a shower in them. So that could be uh, a good option. Um, maybe not in a senior center, maybe if and when, and that was something that I talked to Susan about the senior center moves to its beautiful new home. Uh, she was hoping to take to keep this building and make it more a uh, center for people with dementia. So get it even more uh, uh, dementia friendly and more focused on uh, uh, supporting people that uh, live with dementia. So now we're going to the lower level. And, um, and so this big space with the posts is this big space with the four posts. So unfortunately, as you can see here, um, no windows. The only window is a tiny window right here under the stairs. So it's like a tiny window right here under the stairs. And the entire big space is um, windowless because the wall with the windows was here and the windows were gone when the addition was put on. Uh, the talking about familiarity, uh, familiarity is not only your own home that you came from. Uh, nobody has a room like this 
in their own home, but how many pe people have a church basement that looks like this, that they have spent lots and lots of time there um, uh, with friends and, and events and so on. If they, even the colors remind me of a church basement. So uh, so this is kind of my, my inspiration or vision uh, to, this, to this place. Uh, the uh, acoustics in this large space are wonderful. And uh, that is thanks to the fact that there is acoustic ceiling, maybe a little rogue in some places, but it's there. And the flooring that you see here that look like um, uh, wood is not. It's a, it's a flooring that's called Flotex. And that is something that is uh, manufactured by a company that um, makes these um, almost resilient tiles that have fuzz on them. So when you, you have to practically bend over, touch it, and then you see that it really is not uh, wood or resilient flooring that looks like wood. It's really kind of fuzzy. And I tried to get close and, and show it, but um, uh, you, you actually really have to touch it. So um, you go to, did I, okay, I went one too far. So uh, what are the issues? The issues are no daylight. Um, the other issue is that it's a very large space and it doesn't really lend itself to subdivision very well. Uh, the day that I visited, there was a quite a small group that was meeting here and talking about nutrition and they could have met much more comfortably in a smaller uh, room and not take this entire room and maybe allow for a different concurrent uh, activity to take place. So it's not very dividable. Uh, the stair uh, was quite scary because it had no uh, handrail on one side. And again, thinking about um, all inclusive, who knows when a grandchild uh, uh, joins their uh, uh, grandma or grandpa into the senior center and it's really easy for a child to fall through because there's nothing in here between the stair and the handrail. So that's that's an issue that needs to be um, looked at. Ruth, this doesn't even meet code for a public it's space. Not. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and also uh, there was just one attempt to distinguish or accentuate the edge of the stair. I have to say that for me to descend these stairs was very, very scary because I, everything blended. I could not see where the, the uh, uh, thread ended and the riser started and the drop to the next um, stair was. That is not something that is difficult to do. You can just go get the right, maybe not just a, a gaffer tape, but you can get the right tape and accentuate in a contrasty color, the edge, the edge of the stair. Um, so in, in this case, sometimes the uh, color of the wall and the color of the floor, in some of these images, they look too close together, but in some of them, they don't. So I assume that it's more like the light and the photograph that makes them, but the idea is not to make them like the same hue, even though they are, different, this is paint and this is the uh, fuzzy floor, uh, the way to figure out if they are uh, uh, contrasty enough is to take a photograph, take it all the way to black and white. And if the gray looks really the same, that means that they are in the same family and not uh, contrasty enough, like the situation up uh, in the first floor. And uh, the last thing that we looked at as an issue was the lighting. It's kind of haphazard. It's it's not um, continuous or even, and it does look institutional. So in a room that is uh, windowless, working on the um, a good lighting scheme is can can elevate it uh, a lot from from what it is. 
This is the other part, the, uh, the addition that does have windows uh, and uh, same fuzzy floor. Uh, and uh, this area here is the, is the com uh, computer area with the tiny windows that have like a little well uh, of light. And uh, one thing that they really um, uh, made me uh, happy was the, uh, some, they, they curated some really, really cool art. And this is from uh, the high school uh, art program competition. And um, I, I think people are enjoying it and, and they are creating like discussion point and um, milestones or landmarks for people to know uh, where they are. Uh, I was here near the, the fish or something. Uh, the only downside is it it's not a permanent exhibit. It stays there for a while and then it, it goes someplace else. So kitchen, uh, a kitchen is, um, is a space that can be very familiar as long as it doesn't have a lot of um, commercial and unfamiliar uh, elements. So the good things here is that it, even though it's larger than, larger than a normal residence uh, house kitchen, uh, it is very residential. Uh, every, all the kitchen cabinets are residential. The different counters are in a different color. Even the floor is kind of kitcheny. It's what people expected uh, to see in in a in a sort of an older fashioned kitchen. Um, the only less residential element is this um, sink, and it kind of blends well because it's not too big and it's the same height and as, as the rest of. Uh, the counter, the dishwasher is a super duper dishwasher, but it looks residential. And the whole kitchen is kind of feels residential. It's even as cluttered as a residential. Obviously, there's never enough, never enough storage uh, room. Uh, but it's and and I really like the fact that people thought about these corners. Uh, it's not very pleasant to back into a corner that is sharp. So corners were were um, used, were, were treated appropriately. Um, and there's contrast between um, appliances, cabinets, counter, sink, and again, appliances, the, the fridge is white. So um, there's a lot of thought that makes this a residential looking key kitchen, but with a lot of uh, uh, features that are kind of allowing uh, people with visual issues to maneuver here and work here. Uh, this space also very fortunate to have two nice windows, natural light. And again, if the lighting was a little less um, institutional, that would be great. So the down downside of this kitchen is that it's closed off from the community center. You, th that's the only passage that's always closed because nobody uses it. You can see that they have parked a bunch of stuff on the other side of this little pass-through. So the pass-through is, is not working and uh, people are just um, moving things through, uh, through the opening here, through the door into the dining room, but there's no connection between, between the two, uh, two spaces. So we're almost done, we're down, we're still in the lower level. We're now in this area here in the new addition. This is the pair of doors. And this is the pair of doors that, that is going outside, but unfortunately, because this is the uh, accessible vehicular entrance, when you come out through the set of doors, you go into a parking lot as opposed to a park. So, uh, but that, allows people that are coming to the senior center to attend an event that's in the big community room downstairs. They don't have to struggle with the stairs to go to the elevator and come down. They just uh, are dropped off by a van or a, a little bus, right? And enter through these doors. So, uh, but still right outside, 
there is uh, a green area while I was there, uh, the little um, uh, flag flag things uh, were very promising that there's some work to be done here. They were thinking about a, um, a deck, a flush uh, level deck that people can enjoy the outdoors because when I, when I was there, which was probably, I think April or uh, before that, there was, there was not a lot of people still outside. It was sunny, but it wasn't warm. Um, so the next one is um, the issue that there is no acoustical separation between the activities that happen here in the computer room or in the game room and people coming in to an activity or people coming down the elevator to an activity. So very easily, this can be taken care of by another wall and a door so that the, the, the noise and the talking and actually the noise of what's going on here does not uh, interfere with the activities that usually need more focus and concentration that take, that take place in this addition area. The deck um, that is to the side of the building, it's actually to the side of the building. Um, and we, I should have had the upper story plan here uh, to show where it is. It's not large enough. It cannot take the entire uh, group of uh, clients that can be like at 1.20 or 25 people, but it lends itself to small conversation groups uh, there's also a planting program right here in the recycling bins and people can get to it because there's a ramp and something that was recently added because it's kind of difficult and uh, uh, to maneuver, there is a power assist um, operator that door can open and people can, can go, um, uh, uh, go in and out. Okay. <clears throat> so just, um, Reminder of where we were, uh, front door uh, and reception area, and not the other reception area that we had to deal with. And um, so the next thing we did was we said, okay, what we, we cannot do a lot with this building. What, what, what we, can we do in order to improve it, make it more age friendly, more dementia friendly? So the first thing that we proposed was to add a vestibule so that you can come in, close a door before you open the door and get into the interior of the building. And because some people need um, a wheelchair accessibility and some people can do stairs and, uh, uh, and people come from all directions, we said, okay, this is gonna be a vestibule with two faces. One of them will be the red door that will come from the stair and the other one will be the blue door that will come from the ramp. And then you come in and instead of being um, kind of uh, restricted in this very, very small, uh, oops, in this very small area here, what we did was we took this wall down and created an opening and a much larger combined welcome area and reception where all the information um, and the uh, bulletin board and the uh, brochures can happen here as you enter. We uh, also added like a column of shelves to put different things that people may wanna see, be interested in, moved the sign up into another location, pushed the, um, um, reception area further in and uh, took make the made the closet that was just a regular closet a larger closet so people actually can um, uh, hang their clothes here uh, and when they go out to do uh, any um, activity. So um, when we looked at the bathrooms we did not offer, a lot of changes. This is the ladies' room. This is the men's room. 
Uh, maybe uh, very soon they're going to be neutral, uh, gender neutral. And what we, I told them that very easily by taking this door and moving it further to the center, they have a wonderful space here to add a, uh, an accessible shower if that becomes something that they're interested in. So these are some of the suggestions, especially uh, working on uh, the welcome and arrival experience uh, while the lobby area and the program area remain very similar to what they are. This is the lower level again, big space, no windows, separated kitchen. And what we proposed in this case was there's nothing much we can do with the windows here except for uh, um, suggesting a really nice, even, good looking um, electrical lighting uh, solution. But we could take the kitchen here and open it up completely so that this is actually a counter and the whole, this whole wall is now gone. And actually I lied, these two windows that are in the kitchen can now somehow uh, uh, inadvertently benefit the, the large space with some daylight. And so we took this and did a little bit of um, uh, model sampling, very, very crude. Here is the, um, the vestibule in the front of the building, one side with steps. Yes, we need a handrail. Uh, we ran out of time and uh, a ramp on this side. And the colorful doors are actually making a little more uh, of a statement. Sure, we can do a, a, a much larger gable with uh, some overhangs and make sure, th this is just kind of saying, there is an opportunity to make the drop-off and arrival uh, experience much better. And now we're inside. Uh, so uh, the view here is looking from the, the large community area. This is where the, um, this is where this wall used to be right here. And this whole area is now open. The, uh, a signing area is here. Uh, you can have all the different brochures here and also like a, a large vertical shelf unit with uh, either books or, or, or things you need to look at or baskets or knickknacks or whatever is, is important. And here we are just looking at the um, existing uh, community table. And we looked at another view from whoever the person is, is staff member that may be the receptionist or the manager sitting right here. And that person can view the front door that is now not opening directly to the outdoors, but to a, um, to a vestibule. And from here, they can see like the beginning of this corner here. These, these are these windows and this is this window. So similar approach uh, for the, the lower area. Uh, again, a little bit of a crude uh, imagery, but the, the concept is open that kitchen. You have a counter for eating or, or conversing or assisting with prep. And, uh, and the, the windows that are in the kitchen are actually benefiting the larger space um, and instead of having a blocked wall and a door, you just have a completely open kitchen that converses with the room. And you could see people prepping, you can see people eating, and, uh, and that's it. Any questions? Ruth, I want to emphasize the fact that dementia friendly design doesn't necessarily cost much. Absolutely. Or needs to look a certain way or be fancy. This is where I think uh, the Mass Council on Aging was appreciative to see how spaces could be done really on a budget. A paint color with the right contrast can, can, can take people a long way. Uh, <clears throat> we've had some people 
drop off. It's like 6.40. I want to see if anyone has something they want to discuss and share. Hi, I, I did. Yes. Hi. Um, I had um, a question and a comment. Um, so I saw, is it Philippe? I didn't get the pronunciation. Yes, yes okay. Philippe. Yeah, yes. Uh, you used a lot of single chairs. I didn't see any couches or love seats. I'm just wondering, was that on purpose? Um, Ruth, in some of yours, I saw, I think, a love seat. Uh, any uh, opinions on individual seats versus love seats versus three seat couches? So it all depends what level of senior living you're designing. You, we were showing more on the assisted living side as I was showing my slides. And yes, purposefully, we use very little sofas because okay. we believe that people need two arms to get up from this seating object called a chair. And if it's a large three-seater sofa, Especially, they tend to be cushiony and, and people sink in them, and it's really hard for people to get up. Um, love seats are a little different. Sometimes they help with conversation. Uh, they help to get to people close to each other. But most of the time, we tend to stay away from anything that doesn't have two arms. Okay, great. That's and I just wanted to make a, a comment, um, which yeah. is uh, very frequently. Well, let me say this. I, I think we all need to include uh, four leg tables, uh, in at least some four leg tables, because the center post tables, which I, or center anything table, you really can't get a wheelchair under. Uh, and I think it's very common to do the center post table. So it's just sort of a comment to everybody. Uh, Jackie, you want to say something? Um, just a couple things too. Yeah. Um, I really like the idea of using an adaptable vanity in a commercial space, which I hadn't really thought about. And I guess my only question would be, how would somebody know that they could open it up to be able to sit under it with a wheelchair? But just for all of us to think about, but I like that idea. Yes. Um, the other thing is that I would do whenever possible, a second grab bar, a fold down bar or a hinged bar or something <clears> on the, <throat> so there's two sides for grab bar. And the new bathroom, um, was great. It was just that somebody with a wheelchair couldn't, and I know this was all just sort of, you know, done, whatever, schematically, um, that somebody with a wheelchair couldn't get into the sink because the toilet was sort of right there too. Um, what was the other thing? I, I like the, oh, I know, in the kitchen, I think the only thing you'd need to add would be some kind of a door or sound barrier so that activities could be going on while, while kitchen activities are also going on, on at certain times. Yeah. yeah, I was I like that. I liked all those changes. I guess I wanted to say one other thing. It's kind of a question for Ruth. Um, with having a shower in the bathroom, are you envisioning somebody being able to use the toilet when somebody's taking a shower? Just thinking about you know how much time it would take to take a shower, and if there's not another bathroom, you know, there is, right there is in another the, in the same right, area. There are two bathrooms right next to each other, and then another bathroom. On the lower level yeah so um and and this was not something that was embraced uh enthusiastically uh, i just brought it up because i saw it in more in like adult day health center uh and especially when um i worked in a day center that was dedicated for people with memory issues then um Sometimes the bathing at home would have been such a struggle that the caretakers prefer, preferred to bring the person to the day center and have a trained staff person do it. Not, not, it wasn't just for um, accidents or, or incontinence. It was, it was a planned thing mm -hmm. to offer to people that couldn't deal with it. And so in that I, case yeah. too, if it's, I'm sorry, Kathy, go on. I just wanna say, I guess my uh, comment or suggestion would, would be, I think that's a great idea, but I think if we're designing something new, uh, it would be helpful oh. to have the shower separate from the- For sure. Uh, yes. For yes. sure. Absolutely. Yes, not a and, question. And if it's but, a dementia center to make it very spa-like because we all know how difficult it is for, to get somebody who has dementia into a shower. 
you know, but there's a whole lot of tricks and yeah. visuals and, and environmental things that help that. Yeah. Uh, before people leave, I want to make sure I share the report that we talked about. I put it here. It's a few pages, 20 pages PDF. Uh, please go ahead, use the, go to the link and share it and uh, use it. It has a lot of helpful information and there are people contacts also on it if there's more questions you have for Patty or Pam or anyone else part of the team. Ruth, yes. And by the way, you know that you can save the chat. It doesn't, you, you don't necessarily lose it. If you see the three little buttons on the lower right, click on them and it says save chat. And you get a little text file with all the information in the chat. That was the tip of the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're one minute away from 6.45 and I want to be mindful of people uh, going out their way this evening. Any, any more comments before we close? Right. So the recording will be on the website of the BSA Design for Aging Knowledge Community webpage in probably a day or two if you want to share it with anyone. And hope to see you next uh, next next in November on November 15 for our landscape discussion. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you all. Bye bye.